Hi guys, I get asked this a lot, which is how you can do really, really well in a particular paper. So someone recently DM'd me on Insta saying, how can I get top marks or full marks in my biology IGCSE edXL paper? And so this is really what this video is all about, my approach into making sure that you don't lose those easy marks, that you approach your answers fully, and that basically you give yourself, sorry, that's Lyra, and that basically you give yourself the best possible chance of doing really, really well. So the first thing obviously is to make sure that you don't panic, to make sure that you've properly set yourself up to do as well as possible. And a large part of that is making sure that you're not tired and that you're thinking clearly. So to that end, try and get a good night's sleep the night before. Don't panic too much if you don't sleep that well because I don't want you going into your exam being like, Hazel said that I need eight hours sleep and I didn't get that so I'm not gonna do well. No, 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 no. Try your utmost to get a good night's sleep. If you find that you haven't slept at all, as I often didn't before my exams, then that helpful hormone adrenaline will get you through it. It will get your mind cleared and it'll get you thinking clearly. Make sure you don't stress yourself up in the lineup before the exam. So that means don't stand there like exchanging stuff with your friends, like, how do you do this? How do you do that? It will just confuse you. You might have a different answer to what they think is a good answer. So don't, don't really talk to them. Just kind of keep yourself in your own mindset. Now, one thing I always found helpful when I was doing my revision, there'd be some topics that I'd find quite straightforward. And then there would be some things that I would forget. So I would have a piece of paper with my last minute notes on it. So it looks something like this. And here I just scribble the things that I just need to make sure that I'm getting in the right order or the right words that I can look at just before I go into that exam hall. Obviously don't take it into the exam because they might think you're trying to cheat. There's nothing wrong with looking at this just before you go in. So for me, I always struggled with what a gene was. So I'd write here, using my notes, section of DNA, which codes for a protein. Notice that I'm keeping this super minimal making sure that I don't use too many words. After all, these are my last minute notes. I always used to struggle with the kidney, particularly in terms of blood water content. So I'd write myself a little list here to help me, which would just be, okay, the hypothalamus is what detects water levels. The pituitary gland releases that important hormone, ADH, lots of ADH, increases the permeability of the walls of the collecting duct, meaning that more water is reabsorbed and that there is less urine. So it's more concentrated and it's lower in volume. So by doing that, I've given myself a nice five mark answer. Now, obviously the things that you struggle with will be different to the ones I struggle with, that other people struggle with, that's okay. I'm gonna show you now how I would go about remembering the heart on my last minute notes. Remember that I'm not an artist, so I would just make these super basic notes. Hopefully you recognize the left and right atrium, the left and right ventricles. Remember the vessels coming in to the heart are always veins. So coming into the left atrium will be the pulmonary vein, because remember that comes from the lungs carrying oxygenated blood. Leaving the ventricles is always the arteries. So the one leaving the left ventricle is the aorta. The one leaving the right ventricle is the pulmonary artery. And then lastly, bringing deoxygenated blood back to the heart is the main vein, the vena cava, the vena cava. So yeah, I've got my eye in with that. I know what I'm doing here. Another thing to be good on, remember, it's super essential that you're good with Corm's questions, which are basically experimental design. I don't like using Corm's if you've been following me for a while, you'll know I don't like using this structure. It is essential though that you score full marks on the experimental design question because there are no surprises here. They follow the same layout year on year. So there's really no excuses for dropping easy marks here. So remember for me, when I'm planning an experiment, I like to do my independent variable. So what I'm changing, and I'll actually show you an example of this in situ in an exam question later. The dependent variable, which is what I'm measuring, and then the control variable. And these are multiple variables, so everything that you'll be keeping the same. And often, because it's bio, you'll need to state a time period, make sure it's sensible. And then the final thing you should do is repeat and calculate an average. So that is your basic framework. 
I just want to talk through this particular question because it is a difficult question. It's all to do with genetic crosses and panic squares. And I just want to show you how I would approach it, which means that you don't panic. You say to yourself, look, I've done hundreds of Punnett squares. I know what I'm doing. Just because this question looks slightly different, I can still do a really good job. The key to doing really well is obviously making sure you read every word and don't rush. So the photograph shows a breed of dog called a Border Collie. Border Collies can inherit an eye defect called CEA, Collie Eye Anomaly. The dominant allele D produces good vision, but the recessive allele D produces poor vision. The diagram shows the possible offspring from parents with different genotypes. So let's have a look. This is key here. The dominant allele D produces good vision and the recessive allele D produces poor vision. So let's just write a combination of what would produce good vision and what would produce poor vision. It tells me that in the question. Here we have a diagram and we've even got a key, so that's quite helpful. So cross P. We can actually write what they are because of the key here. So we've got two homozygous recessives, parents, meaning that all the offspring have the same genotype. So guess what? They're going to have poor eyesight, according to my notes above. I'm not having to work out anything here. This information is all provided in the question. So you can go through and actually do it all. And if it is a question that you're going to struggle with, do it at the end when you've got more time because you know how much of the paper you've already completed. Don't worry about doing the paper in order. Just make sure you answer every single question. If you leave a question blank because you think your answer is stupid, by leaving it blank, you're automatically guaranteeing yourself zero marks. Even if you write a stupid answer or what you consider to be a stupid answer, you'll still have the chance of scoring a mark. And remember, it's anonymous. No one knows who wrote that answer. The examiner doesn't care, so honestly, please make sure I'll be really cross if you message me and tell me that you left a question blank. Please don't do that. So, carrying on with this. All the offspring from cross R have good vision. Yep, that makes sense. They're all big D. Big D. Give the letters of the other crosses where all the offspring have good vision. So we're looking for where we have both big D, big D, and big D, small d, in order for them to all have good vision. If I don't see that combination, then they won't have good vision. This bunch and this bunch. So that's T and U. Give the phenotype of each parent used in cross P. It's basically their physical appearance, so whether they have the disease or not. So looking at cross P here, well, according to the notes I made myself, small d, small d is poor vision. So I'm just going to write that. And what was that disease called? CEA. Just keeping my answer nice and full here, because the mark scheme may want me to have written the name of the disease. Which cross has a 50% probability of producing offspring with good vision? Okay, this is more difficult. Looking along then, it's definitely not cross P because we know that they're all poor vision. Looking now at cross Q, I'll just tell you, this is poor vision. Good vision, good vision, good vision. So that's not 50%. I've already said that R is all good. Now looking at S, we've got poor vision, poor vision, good vision, good vision. So that is a 50% chance. And then we know that T and U were both good. So actually the answer that drops out is S. Give the genotype of each of the offspring produced in cross T. Well, genotype is what alleles they have, so I've actually already done that. It's big D, small d. Because remember, genotype, we need alleles. Phenotype, it's the physical appearances. The crosses between the dogs are examples of sexual reproduction. Name the gametes produced by males in sexual reproduction. Thank goodness we're getting a bit more chill with this sort of question. You should just know that a gamete is a sex cell. So what's the name of the male sex cell? Well, it's the sperm. And likewise, name the gametes produced by females in sexual reproduction. Those are the egg cells. Give the term used to describe diffusion of gametes. So what happens when that sperm hits the egg, when it fuses? Well, it's known as fertilization. And then lastly, in which organ of a female parent do offspring develop. The key word here is organ. 
So where does the offspring develop? Well, it develops in the female's uterus or womb. Now, this question was absolutely full of keywords, so I'd really use my highlighter. Here, I'm naming gametes. Here, I'm giving the genotype. Here, I have to provide the cross. Here, I'm providing the phenotype. Now, if I hadn't read those questions properly and I started writing genotypes, where I was supposed to be writing phenotypes, and likewise the other way around, I'd automatically be giving myself zero marks which would be a huge shame considering I'm, I'm, I know this, I've understood it. I hope you notice with this question that it did require quite a lot of time, quite a lot of input, definitely not one to rush through. So like I said, if you're not confident, go back and answer it at the end. Let's just touch on this question. This warning appears on the side of a cigarette packet. Smoking seriously damages your health and those around you. Describe how smoking damages the lungs. Okay, so five marker. Luckily, we don't have to be too careful with our English. Just a list of really valid key points. Don't keep repeating yourself. So I'll make, make a few notes up here. Lungs. Hmm. So we're looking at lung cancer, potentially bronchitis. I know that there are cilia lining the trachea. Could cause issues there. And I know of a really horrible lung disease called emphysema. So these are particularly related to the lungs probably not going to talk about carbon monoxide because that's more of a general problem to do with the blood. However, they're not going to mark you down if you randomly include more information or slightly irrelevant information. As I always say to my tutees, just include everything and they'll ignore anything that's kind of excessive or not quite what they're after. Don't not write stuff because you'll sometimes find that stuff you think is irrelevant will be on the mark scheme. So we're going to start forming our answers. So ta found in cigarettes is a carcinogen and causes lung cancer. Next up, tar paralyzes the cilia lining the trachea and mucus laden with bacteria builds up causing bronchitis. Smoking damages the alveolar walls leading to reduced surface area for gas exchange. This is known as emphysema. Now, check the number of marks available, five marks, and get into the habit of working out where you think you might have scored the marks. I mean, you might be wrong. We're going to look at a mark scheme in a second. I'm just going to work out. Okay, they might be generous with me actually naming tar. I think they'll like the answer to lung cancer. They'll definitely like the mention of cilia. This is quite a technical word, bronchitis, so I'm hoping that that's worth a mark. Damaging the alveolar walls, again, fairly technical, leading to reduced surface area and the mention of the disease emphysema. So in my mind, I think I've scored one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think I'm hopefully providing at least seven marking points here. It's really important that you think you've provided at least the minimum compared with what the mark scheme is allocating. And now we're going to check the mark scheme. I definitely said bronchitis. I mentioned cilia. I mentioned cancer, I said the word tar, I said the word emphysema, I said smaller surface area for gas exchange, so I actually said both of those things, and I said that the alveoli were damaged. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah. So that is five whole marks in the bag. Twelve. As promised, I said I'd go through a Corm's experimental design question. So here it is, question twelve. Eating garlic is thought to reduce the chance of being bitten by insects such as mosquitoes. Design an investigation to find out if people who have eaten garlic are less likely to attract mosquitoes than people who have not eaten garlic. Your answer should include experimental details and be written in full sentences. So what did I say? The independent variable I want to describe, the dependent variable, at least three control variables. There's nothing wrong with you writing notes to yourself, by the way. Time frame and repeat. So, starting, well, the independent variable, what am I changing? Some people, so according to this experiment, some people will have garlic and some people won't. So some people will be fed garlic, whilst others will not be fed garlic. Really, really making it clear. So, independent variable done. What will I be measuring? Well, how could I work out if they're going to 
stand more or less of a chance of being bitten by a mosquito as well. I'm going to count the number of mosquito bites. I will count the number of mosquito bites received by both types of people. Right, at least three control variables. Anything sensible, I will use the same gender and age of people. What else could make a difference? I'm just making up stuff here. They will be fed the same diet other than garlic consumption, because obviously that's what we're changing. And also, obviously, if you're naked, you're going to receive more bites than if you're fully clothed. So they need to wear similar clothing. They will wear the same clothing. Okay, we've given at least three control variables. Next up, a time period. The experiment will run for one month. Finally, I will repeat and calculate an average. Right, let's see how many marks I've got according to the mark scheme. So the first mark is for stating that some people will be fed garlic and others will not. I said that I'm going to repeat it. I said I'm going to count the number of mosquito bites. I said a time period. And then I said I'm going to use the same gender of people, the same diet of the people, and the same clothing. So that's two marks. So let's count it up. One, two, three, four, five, six. Perfect, I got six out of six. The only thing I didn't mention was anything to do with the mosquito. But you know what? I got full marks, so I'm really happy with that.